perspectives. And you all know about glues, but I did want to go into a little bit more depth with you, and then we can do Q&A, certainly at the end of this presentation and then next class even. But uh, basically, there's uh, four types of methods for adhesives to cure, and you're generally familiar with these, but I just kind of want to prattle through these and then talk a little bit about the chemistry of as well. And so the first one is evaporation. And this is what we see with the PVA glues, the polyvinyl acetate glues, like craft glue, Elmer's glue, that sort of thing. Uh, these are, in, in those cases, are water soluble. That's why you were able to mix them with water to make the spray adhesive. And what these are are emulsions. They're, they're suspensions of, uh, of um, uh, solids and liquids. And as a liquid, water in this case evaporates. The solids squeeze closer and closer to each other so that the surface forces between the particles are strong enough to cause adhesion. And we'll look at that more in the next slide, what that actually looks like. And uh, this relates to um, 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 chemistry, so that's interesting. And then you have two-part epoxies, which you're familiar with, and we'll talk, we'll tell some more stories about those. So these are chemical reactions. Um, we have uh, phase changes, like hot glue going from liquid phase to solid phase in a very easy way. And then we have reaction with radiation, like you would see maybe at a dentist's office where UV or an adhesive is irradiated by UV. And we'll look at some other kind of expansions of those uh, methods, but I just wanted to start that off. Now here we'll look at chemistry. So we'll kind of get into geek mode right away. So there's four categories of bonding, and I'll kind of go through all these and then go back in a little bit more detail. So there's mechanical locking. So what you're looking at to the right is a microphotograph of an adhesive inside a pore of another material. So all surfaces have roughness, even glass. That's how geckos can walk. So all surfaces have roughness to them to some degree. And you can get adhesives that work by mechanical locking. The, the liquid adhesive flows into the pores. And when it hardens, you get a mechanical lock. And that's, that's going to be a very strong thing. And surface forces, which we'll elaborate further upon, are um, um, typically van der Waals or hydrogen bonding, typically van der Waals, which are these weak surface forces that all materials have, especially polar materials like water, you know, H2O, which we'll look at a bit. They have these weak but important forces that are uh, what cause adhesives to work in many cases, and it's what causes phases to change too. So we, so that's how uh, uh, gases turn into liquids and solids through these surface forces. Then you have chemical bonds. Um, so you think of the covalent, ionic, and metallic bonds. And covalent are the most common that I know of in, in adhesion. And then finally, there's diffusion in which uh, molecules are sufficiently mobile that they can work between the, the uh, two materials between the substrate and the adhesive. So the thing you're gluing in the glue itself, the molecules are fluid enough to work through that. And I'll show you an example of that. There's diffusion bonding that's used in welding. You may have heard of that. It's a fairly new technique used for high boiling point uh, metals. But this is a little different. And it's used, in, in my experience, I know of it only in medical products, uh, where you, through pressure and temperature, you <clears throat> cause this diffusive behavior you encourage a diffusive behavior. So you get this bond that uh, doesn't have adhesive. So there's only one material, which makes things optically clear. But also, as far as uh, FDA approval for materials, they love it too. So you don't have the separate adhesive in this medical device. OK, so looking further, and again, uh, please be patient with this part, just trying to give you uh, your money's worth, give you all the information you can think about hopefully with adhesives. Now there's more to it and there's, I was talking to a guy just two weeks ago, he was a specialist in glue, or maybe it's three weeks ago. And uh, people can go in, in great depths on adhesives are really important for a lot of the industrial applications. Uh, they're used uh, to uh, bond windshields together. Uh, we've used them, I've, in my, when I was in industry, used them to adhere things to highways and such. Really, really powerful things. So these, what we're looking at here are surface forces. This is how most adhesives work. Uh, molecules are, you know, they have protons and electrons, and there's a morphology, a shape to the, um, or I say a to topography, to, uh, to the molecule that gives it sort of the plus and minus side. So you can think of them as little um, magnets. And here's an, ex you see this in this image here, you have a simple atom. This is spherical. Um, 
but most molecules are not spherical. So hydrogen helium would be, because they have S orbitals. But when you get P orbitals and higher level orbitals, you get these shapes that are, that are uh, um, asymmetric. And so what you get here on the bottom, you see you have a plus and a minus. They're sticking to each other. So if you get them fairly close to each other, they'll stick. And um, what you normally have then is the, the, the uh, solvent wrapped around these molecules. But when it evaporates, the molecules get closer and closer. When they get fairly close to one another, these surface forces come into play. So they, they're trivial when the molecules are far away, like in liquid glue. But once the glue dries, these molecules, as the, as the solvent goes away, they get physically closer. So this is, this is really what you're looking at down here is really what makes craft glues work in most glues is this, this electrostatic attraction between the molecules. And this is why you need good surface prep and things like that. Everything, all the particles have to be physically close to each other. And here on the right, I have an example of a, a polymer chain. So polymers are, are, can often be very, very long molecules and the contact points are very few. So here you see there's only a handful of contact points that allow adhesion. And this is covalent bonding. So in, in um, ionic bonding, you're actually exchanging electrons. Covalent bonding, you're sharing electrons, so this is water. And this is a bonding scheme. So here we're looking actually at a molecule itself, and, and water in this case, not adhesive, but that's how covalent bonds work. And what this does is it lowers the energy state of the molecules, so it's the, um, the uh, second law of thermodynamic driven state for things. They, they want to join when energies are reduced. And this is a, a visual example of diffusion bonding that I mentioned before. So this is, um, again, I, I kind of described this in words, but it's, uh, it's not using a separate adhesive, but using pressure and temperature to cause molecules to diffuse through the the layer. So if you can see up here, you've got a, a joint layer and such, and that's, that's how that works. Uh, not really an issue in model building so much that I've ever thought of. Here's a couple terms for you, adhesion versus cohesion. So adhesion is the, the uh, stickiness of the adhesive to the substrate. So how, how well, like, like Elmer's glue sticks to wood. And cohesion is the internal strength of the adhesive. So those are two terms. And um, Often adhesion is a bigger problem, which has a lot to do with surface preparation, but cohesion is the final strength. So you might be interested in things like which is better, epoxy or polyurethane, if you work with that. And, and when you get into really high strength adhesives, uh, these issues become more and more important. In fact, when you look at composites, especially carbon fiber and aramid fiber, like Kevlar, the, the uh, adhesion is a, is a major issue. How do you stick something to carbon? Because nothing wants to stick to carbon. And it's a real challenge. And uh, you need clean room environments, really clean surfaces to, to do that sort of thing. In fact, with a lot of composites, like you might make, make a boat from or an airplane, you get what are called pre-pregnated composites, so pre-pregs, in which the, there's a, uh, a layer of epoxy wrapped around the carbon when you get it. Or, or uh, Kevlar slash aramid, or even fiberglass. I guess I don't know that much about fiberglass. But, um, as far as pre pregs go. I've used fiberglass a lot, and we can talk about that later too. But, okay, stresses on joints. So in a, a glue joint loves compression. That's not a problem, right? Because it's not doing anything. And actually, adhesives generally are very strong in shear. Tremendous surface area is available to work with. Weaker in tension and perhaps weakest in cleavage or peel. And there's tests that people use for adhesives. And I'll show you some examples. These are some examples of uh, tests that are used. So you can see there's peel tests and 90 degree peel, 180 degree peel. And this is such a big business that this protocol is very strict and there's people that are just experts in this sort of thing because unlike masking tape and such things, um, in industrial applications, there's a tremendous liability connected with how well adhesives work. And in your lifetime and mine too, we've seen the replacement of fasteners by adhesives. It's growing, growing, growing all the time, which is really neat because generally you get rid of stress concentrations and you save labor and do all kinds of good things with, uh, with adhesives. Okay, a lot of words that describe what I talked about. One thing that's nice with PVA glue, so to use the fancy term, the uh, polyvinyl acetate term, is you can mix it with things. So you can thicken it with uh, wood dust. 
uh, or other things. In fact, uh, even with some, even epoxy, you can do that as well. You can thicken it with uh, powdered wood or micro bubbles, which I, I do in some boat work. So if you want to make a putty, you want to thicken the viscosity, you can do that. But PVA glue is really good for that too. So it's very versatile. So often when you think of adhesives, you think of you, know, you really got to follow the rules and, and do things exactly the way they say. Well, with PVA glues, you do you have some some liberty. You can do a lot of things, including coloration and all sorts of things. So uh, if you look at some glues like tight bond and such, which is a, uh, a PVA glue, it's used for a lot of woodworking. Um, there's all sorts of variants. You can make it waterproof. You can make it different colors. You can make the cure rate slower or faster. Um, you can really change things a lot. You can use heat guns to evaporate things. That's not illegal. You're just evaporating water. Um, so you have a lot of uh, you know, ability to change these things or change the properties. And I'll mention it kind of, you know, we've studied acrylic paints and you work with acrylic paints. And hopefully, you'll, well, some of you have worked with epoxy paints and see how frustrating those can be. So with acrylic paints, just because it connects with this pretty well, they're very similar in a lot of ways. You can change the, the drying rate for acrylics by, with certain additives, you can change the viscosity to make acrylics uh, dry slower or faster. So most people, the challenge people will have with acrylics is they dry too fast. So you can get retarders that slow down the, the rate of um, drying. And they're yeah, much the same as PVA, so it's kind of a good model. In fact, there's a whole, I've got a whole bunch of different additives for acrylics, which is super geeky, but I do, uh, to change the thickness and the, the cure rate and the working time and all these things. And the same is true with PVAs. So you know one trick, how to make contact cement or uh, spray adhesive anyway with PVAs, and there's others as well. Like I said, thickening with wood. Now then we have a category of solvent cements and the hero of the day is PVC cement. So some of you have glued PVC pipes, which is so easy and fun. And these actually dissolve the material. And you've done that with the uh, polystyrene cement too. Um, it's the same sort of uh, um, phenomenon where you're dissolving the plastic in both cases. And if we look at PVC, for example, you use acetone to prepare the surfaces, to clean the surfaces so that the, the PVC cement can get actually at the PVC. And it's usually called purple primer if you were to buy it in the store, but you can get clear primer as well. The purple is just so that building inspectors can see that you've used it. But uh, if you're building like big models out of PVC, you don't want, well, if they have to be really strong uh, and you want to use primer, you can buy clear primer, it doesn't show up. Uh, in practice, if you're doing something in PVC and you just want it to be reasonably strong, you don't even have to worry about the uh, about the primer. And the only incident in my life that I've seen where safety glasses helped was with PVC primer. So I think I sh maybe shared that anecdote before, but the fellow was using the dauber and it, as he pulled it out, it sprayed uh, primer on his face. And primer's acetone and he had safety glasses on, not a big deal. If he didn't have safety glasses on, it would have burned out of his eyes. So I was standing right next to him when it happened. So I thought it was interesting because it wasn't the sort of thing you'd think of as safety glasses helping you for, but it did. Okay. Um, I, and I'll mention too, it's kind of the, sort of an adjunct. If some of you have used uh, high density polyethylene, uh, there's some really interesting fasteners that you use that have built in heating elements. So you can hook up piping systems plug them into some electrodes and it melts the uh, polyethylene and makes joints. And that's kind of fascinating uh, to sort of the kindred spirit of PVC. So pipes are good for model building in a lot of ways because you can make big things. So my favorite way to make big things is one by twos. That's why we have them all over the studio. But uh, PVC is really good too. The problem with PVC is it's wobbly. It's not as strong as one by twos. But it's, they're clean, they're straight, they're cheap, they're easy to work. Um, but one by twos are easy to work too, right? You get a little jigsaw and a brad nailer and some glue and you're in good shape. Okay, hot glue, uh, one of my favorites because if you have attention deficit disorders and you want things to go together quickly, and you're in a, a hyper uh, a hyperactive build mode, a hot glue gun lets you stick things together really fast. And what hot glue does, of course, is it's, uh, it's plastic and you, you melt it and and um, usually around one, I think the low end is like 135, uh, but there's some high temperature ones as well. You melt it, it cools pretty quickly, and boom, you've got a mechanical connection. It's ugly, 
all it's doing is grabbing material, grabbing whatever it can grab and wrapping itself around it like a spider wrapping itself around a, a, uh, a fly, but it works well. And what I do sometimes, again, one of my favorites for prototyping is I'll take a, a damp paper towel and you can cool the joint very quickly or quell the burning fingers that inadvertently touch the hot tip of your hot glue gun. Um, so a really useful type of glue. And I'll mention too that um, you can use glues in tandem. So we'll look at polyurethanes here shortly. And polyurethane is really powerful, but it's slow. So you can use epoxies, PVAs, or hot glues to temporarily hold a joint while a really strong glue like polyurethane is doing its trick. So you can put it, uh, in fact, we did that, I think, with the rocks. Yeah, we put some, if you remember, some of you anyway, put a, a ring of PVA craft glue around the rocks and put a daub of, uh, a dab of hot glue in the middle and put that in your diorama and the hot glue held it in place. So of course clamps are better and clamping pressure is better, but sometimes that doesn't work. So you can use glues in tandem. Uh, so hot glues and PVAs are the low lying fruit. They're not that strong, but they're safe, they're fast, they're cheap. There's a lot of good things about that. And especially in prototyping, they work really well. Uh, cyanoacrylate is, is a heroic glue. Uh, you probably all used it. And uh, it's often called CA glue, super glue. It's all the same thing. And you can buy it in different viscosities. And it works really well when you have good intimate contacts with surfaces. So like broken plates, that's what it's good for. You break a plate and it's a, a fairly clean, well, it's a clean break. You put super glue on it and you become the hero of the day because it works well. Uh, it doesn't work on some materials very well. Uh, very porous materials, wood is a good example. But you can use kickers or accelerants to make them work well. So uh, CA glues are really, really nice if you're making balsa wood projects because if you take CA glue, super glue, and a kicker, you can glue a balsa very fast. You know, waiting and it's strong right away. And I can show you an example of that later. <laughs> but uh, the, the problem with the kicker is it's really malodorous and it would smell the whole studio. So you can't really use it there. <laughs> it's kind of like Bondo, it just, uh, it's not friendly to public places. So a strong chemical smell, but you can get the kicker online. It lasts a long time. I, I have, I don't know how many I have. I have a few bottles and I've never used any of them up. Um, so it's, it's a great adjunct to CA glues when things don't glue. Um, but they're, they're strong, uh, not as strong as epoxies and polyurethanes, but they're very strong. And you know, when you talk about strength, often you're talking about really the surface prep. The, the cohesion is often very high for these things, but often this adhesion is involved in getting things to adhere to the substrate. So polyurethane and epoxies are the heroes of the day. If you want something to be glued and never go away, these are your go-tos. And um, epoxies are two parts, polyurethanes. I, I've used one called Sitka, but there's a lot of, oh, I just got a note saying your internet connection is unstable. So uh, as it turns out, uh, Terrence, you're the only one I can see. So uh, if, if I just kind of go dead, if you can just give me a, 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 a sign, that would help me. Okay, thanks. Um, but polyurethanes are used in industry. So they're used to replace fasteners. And what's interesting with that is often if you are getting into an airplane and you see the wings out there, and if somebody tells you they're held together by glue, you don't really like that so well. So there's a certain <laughs> psychological uh, phenomenon in which we kind of want to get visual assurance of things. So um, I don't know where that will go, but rivets and fasteners is, are, are kind of nice to see because we trust them. Glues seem to be invisible, but in fact, glues are doing more and more and more. In fact, in aviation, <laughs> okay, in aviation, for example, uh, they're making more and more parts out of single ingots. And uh, and yeah, and even 3D printing of metals has become commercially viable in the medical sector. Anyway. Those devices are horribly expensive, but you can make these really delicate matrices and bones can go around and such so um, you know there's a lot of movement in that way but anyway these are um, I want to talk a little bit about epoxy so I have a video in the PowerPoint that you can get from Plato and I think I sent you a separate link too about fiberglass so your model builders so 
you know, money's an issue and your prototypers too, which is really kind of just what we're doing is both prototyping and model building rather than precision model building. But um, money's an issue, right? So epoxies are very versatile. And when, um, for example, if you want to make a boat, uh, uh, you can make a boat cheaply out of, and the cheapest boat I made was, uh, I call it the bounty hunter with the glass floor and uh, kind of loved it in a way. Uh, one, one sheet, one four bay sheet of three eighths OSB oriented strand board, the cheapest panel you can get, and some fiberglass tape, and some epoxy, and you stitch it together with uh, zip ties, and you you glue the joints, so they tape down, or smear some epoxy down, lay the tape over it, smear it again with epoxy, and boom, you're done. And so it's really versatile stuff. It's, it's um, and there's a lot of science connected with it. You can get optically clear forms, um, which is really nice. So for example, and, and this is what I've done with woodworking projects, if you have a woodworking project and you want to protect it from the elements, you can wrap it in fiberglass. Uh, uh, um, well, there's different types of fiberglass so, uh, mat that you can get, mats and rovings and things like that. And then you can wet it with optically clear epoxy and you can't see it. So your wood is behind this beautiful layer of fiberglass and epoxy protected from the elements and it still looks beautiful. So it's really a neat trick. And what you do, even at a larger scale, not industrial scale, but like a boat building and such scale, is uh, you can get two part epoxies. Like there's a gun shown here up in the top, but I use dispensers You press down on the dispenser and they're metered. So one, one uh, pump of the resin, one pump of the hardener, and it automatically gets the ratio right for you. So it's a real fast way to make up epoxies. And of course they're used in, in carbon fiber as well. Okay, I'm not gonna go over this too much. These are just terms. So um, pot time, set time, and cure time. You can look at that. There's a, you know, working time is, is a common notion of how much time you have. No, I only have 10 minutes. How much time you have to work with. Uh, oh, rats. Uh, it punished me, okay. How much time you have to work with um, um, the adhesive, and then of course cure time. And there was a case we had where there was a, well, there was a lot of heroic stories. There are some adhesives that cure to full strength very, very quickly. I mean, the ones you know the most are if you get a filling from a dentist, um, and those cure right away under UV. But even those that cure by other means, it's, it's incredible how fast somebody's cured to full strength especially for emergency repairs, like underwater repairs and other emergencies. So these are some joint designs. Um, adhesives don't like to be in tension, peel. They like to be in compression. So the one on the right here is the strongest joint. So you can do things to help, help joint design. But even here, if you look at this middle one, <clears throat> if you look at adhesives, it has all, a lot to do with surface area and with um, um, surface prep. So here you have a lot more, in the middle one, you have a lot more surface area than you do over here. Plus you're putting some of this in shear. Okay, and this surface prep, uh, you want things clean. And the reason you want things clean is you want this adhesive quality to be enhanced. You want the adhesive to have as much contact with the substrate as possible. And you do that by cleaning, uh, clean and dry. Uh, now some adhesives don't, or sometimes things don't have to be dry, like with PVAs or even, even CA glues but generally you want them very clean. So they, they get into the, the nooks and crannies of the, of the material of the substrate. And then clamping is good too, because you're trying to, min not only does that give you better penetration of the surface, but you get a thinner adhesive layer. And what you do, for example, with composites is you do often vacuum bagging, where you wrap everything in a plastic and you hook it up to a vacuum pump and draw all the air out that squeezes the materials together and it draws the epoxy in deeply throughout the whole material. So, because glue doesn't give you really strength. The only thing it gives you strength in, in composites is the fiberglass or the Kevlar or the carbon, not so much the glue. The glue uh, allows the, the fibers to transmit roads to one another. Okay, poor wetting, good wetting. So you can see here, this is a case where you think you've covered something with adhesive, but actually there's very poor connection with the bonding surface or the substrate. And down here, you have a very good connection. And then just really quickly, history is a glue. In fact, I'll just kind of maybe do a highlight with the Mongol bowl, bows. Uh, I like archery. I used to do that a lot. And I was always intrigued by 
ancient bows, and one of the more interesting ones is the Mongol bows, in which these were designed to be fired uh, uh, underway on top of the horse. So they had to be physically small. So they couldn't, they didn't use the long bow techniques that you saw in Europe. They made uh, composite bows. So the inner part of the bow would be bone, which is really strong in compression, and the outer part would be tendon from an animal, and that's very good in tension. So they mix these two materials together and adhere them both with strapping and, ad and adhesives that are a mystery to science and um, exactly how they did that. But even in the old days, glues were very important. Uh, I mentioned violins because you're probably you maybe familiar with Stradivarius uh, finish is not well understood. The, the actual varnish used for uh, uh, Stradivarius is not well understood and, and that's kind of a mystery glue of sorts. But even you have glues that are made uh, uh, based on animal proteins, milk, KCM glue. Um, there's a lot of variants of that. Long, are they're, they're proteins, and they've been used since antiquity. They've uh, they've shown up in the pyramids, and uh, so adhesives have been around a long, long time. And you've seen them, you know, the the, uh, the resin from plants. You've seen that yourself. So here's uh, vulcanization. Uh, notice I have to stop yawning. We're almost done here. Actually, I think we only have a few minutes. So, oh yeah, I've got five minutes and forty-five seconds. Yes. So. Um, um, Vulcanization is a, a cross-linking of sulfur and rubber, so it's a way to make rubber products. And phenolic is that cool kind of brown plastic you may have seen in ancient things. Uh, it's sort of the first plastic. And, and fiberglass came up in the 30s. Uh, it was used for radar domes even in the 30s uh, because it didn't present any blockage to the radar. Okay. And the only thing to highlight here in the few minutes I have is a pressure sensitive adhesives, which is the other video I have. So PSAs are used like in tapes and they're actually globules of adhesives and things like um, post-it notes have different size globules. So you sort of use the bigger ones initially and then you peel those off. Um, you're left with sort of mid-sized and then, then you have smaller globules. So it uses different size globules of PSA adhesive to get this effect of being able to peel it and unpeel it. So it's sort of this polymodal design of adhesives. Silicones are really heroic. They're cheap, they're high temperature, suitable. That's not a real good sentence, but you know what I mean. So they work, operate at high temperature. They take a long time to cure. They save the day in many, many cases because um, they're quite strong if they handle the high temperature well. And anaerobic adhesives like Loctite are, are important too and have saved many lives, I'm sure. <laughs> And they work without air. And then I talked about some of these uh, organically based glues, so I won't really expand upon that. But one thing, and this could even be a project for you too, is um, paper mache, making your own glue with flour and salt. Uh, it's, uh, it works. And it's all surface forces, usually Van der Waals forces. So uh, surface forces are, are really important things in understanding glues, and uh, we can tap into that further. And just a couple more things. Actually, I won't even go over this. I, I wanted to, let's see, I've got a thing on, well, nature, which I have a video link for you. Maybe we'll talk about that. Uh, get, I have a link on some gecko technology, gecko simulation technology, but geckos and barnacles, barnacles especially, a fascinating type of adhesive there. There's been a lot of research trying to copy it, but it's hard to do. Geckos, uh, check the video link I have, and maybe we'll talk about that more next time too. Um, and then I want to end it with this thermal staking because this is really important for high volume production of electronics, especially. Which, uh, since we're talking about uh, prototyping off of Buick plastics, and what it does basically is it makes it like a pop rivet. So you force the plastic to have this cap and it retains it that way. So I, I just want to show you that. I do have some other linkages that show information on radio frequency welding and ultrasonic welding, which is important in a lot of the areas, uh, uh, even. Um, uh, garment production, so that's something. And then press fits are sort of, this is the last slide, and this is where uh, a type of adhesion in which you drive, we'll say one metal into another. So metals and all materials are elastic to some degree. You put pressure on them and they move like a rubber band. So I can force a shaft into a hole and, and they um, develop this intimate bond between each other that causes this uh, adhesion. Uh, so it's it's not just friction. It's friction it can almost be. It's not a diffusion bond either, but they can actually um, um, sort of meld into each other in a way. Uh, 
this is by plastic deformation. You can do this with heat too. You can heat up a collar and, and uh, shrink it around a shaft. But these are working largely by surface forces like we talked about before, which can be interrupted with things like oil. So you don't want to put oil on this before you do that. 